Good morning. Legendary singer Lena Horne once said, it's not the load that breaks you down. It's the way you carry it. With a lifelong struggle with dyslexia, those words resonate with me deeply. As a community of supporters and those struggling with dyslexia, we are all here today to learn ways to help those with dyslexia to successfully carry the load of dyslexia. Now, how many here are parents? Quite a few, probably most everyone here is a parent. Now, as a parent, you'll probably agree with me that there was no greater joy than when your long-awaited child came into the world. Now, what's generally the first thing you do? Well, isn't it to make a visual inspection? Does it have all of its fingers, all of its toes? Is everything where it should be? Is it healthy? And after that, you begin to relax and, and picture all the many possibilities with your child. Most parents want their child to grow up healthy and happy and to be successful. And as a parent, you may even have certain educational expectations. Perhaps you want them to follow in your footsteps in your profession, or perhaps to take advantage of educational opportunities that you didn't have when you were a child. After all, what parent doesn't want their child to have the best possible education? And when you're holding your newborn, the possibilities are endless. But then, your child starts school. And here's where the visual inspection of your newborn didn't tell you the whole story. Now, can you tell just by looking which child is dyslexic? Can you tell which uh, child may one day be a doctor, a lawyer? Maybe an electrician, an engineer, a chef, or any other profession? See, here's where a visual inspection doesn't give you the full picture. Now, that happens to be my first grade uh, class photo. Uh, I think this was my second year in first grade. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. Now, if you don't recognize me, I'm the one right in the center with a little triangle right there. I, 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 uh, a little bigger now. Now, when I started school, my parents had the same expectation for me as most parents have for their children. And the, the school that my teachers had the same expectation for me as they had with any other child. But it didn't take long for things to go horribly wrong. I wasn't learning. And I struggled through an entire year in first grade. And I was so far behind, and I had a lot of other, in addition to having dyslexia, I have other sibling conditions, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and a little bit of dyspraxia. And all of those just added to, to my, uh, my misery. It wasn't until I was the only child in the entire school that was held back in first grade. In my second year in first grade, there was a special education teacher. Her name was Mrs. Davis, and I'll remember that, that day from here to that name from here to eternity. She was taking an extension course in dyslexia, from what I understand. And when my teacher was describing the struggles that I was having, she re immediately recognized it as, he has dyslexia. And so she invited myself and my parents over to her house. This was on a Saturday. And I remember this vividly because she had a room prepared for me with a big bowl of, bowl of uh, Cheetos. And so I got kind of relegated to that room, and uh, I was probably in there by myself for a good hour. And I, I think I went through the entire bowl, bowl of Cheetos, too. My, my fingers were all uh, stained. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they talked about, but the decision was that for an hour a day, she would take me out of my first grade class, and she would work one-on-one -on -one with me to help me with my reading. And she did that for several months. And she got me to the point where I was able to read and advance to the next grade. However, as I mentioned, dyslexia can involve more than just a struggle with reading. There are a lot of sibling conditions, and we'll talk about those in a bit, that can make life complicated. So even though I was now able to at least muddle through reading, I still struggled throughout my school years. Now, there are many successful dyslexics 
uh, today that are held out as examples for our young ones. Uh, you may recognize or know a few. For instance, Charles Schwab was one that comes to mind, or actors like Henry Winkler, just to name a few. And these are held up as examples, and it's good for dyslexic kids today to see that despite the struggles of dyslexia, that you can still succeed. There are also famous characters from history that you can look at that are believed to be dyslexic. For instance, Albert Einstein or Thomas Edison. Why were they thought to be dyslexic? Because their early childhood years, they also had the same struggle with reading and other difficulties. But what most are unfamiliar with are the many many dyslexic children that fall through the educational cracks and the numbers are staggering. And it can happen in any family regardless of the social or economic background. Current estimates state that 20 percent of the population has dyslexia. Now one would expect that number to be consistent across all demographics. However, that is not the case. We can get a, a clue about the widespread consequences of undiagnosed and unsupported dyslexia from what may seem to be an unlikely place. In the year 2000, there was a, a study of the Texas prisons, inmates, and it discovered that 80%, 80% are illiterate, two-thirds have poor reading comprehension, and nearly 50% are dyslexic. Now this was a study just in Texas prisons. Now other states have also had studies that have shown similar results. Now in chapter 12 of my book, Raising a Child with Dyslexia, under the subheading, The Dangers of Undiagnosed Dyslexia, I share the story of Amir Baraka. Now for those that were at this conference in 2017, you may recognize this story. Uh, Baraka grew up in the most impoverished and violent housing project in New Orleans. Now, Baraka always had trouble reading, and if that weren't bad enough, he had a drug-addicted, uh, imprisoned father, and note this, a mother who called him dumb and stupid because he couldn't read. Now, all of this combined was a perfect storm. The result? Baraka became a juvenile delinquent. Baraka clearly remembered the day his undiagnosed dyslexia defined his life, defined his life. In the sixth grade, he said, I was called before my English class to read, and my teacher simply embarrassed me because I sat there for about 10 minutes just floundering through a book, not knowing any of the words. You know what he said? I knew. I knew that day that I was going to be a dope dealer. Wow. And these, this is not an isolated incident. This happens to children all over the country that slip through the educational cracks. Diagnosed at age 23 in prison, he states, undiagnosed and unsupported dyslexia is a pipeline to the streets and then to prison. It's time we change that, but how? So here's what we'll discuss. There are a lot of misconceptions about dyslexia, even among many parents and educators, and there's a lot of prejudice. And so we'll discuss what dyslexia is and what it isn't. Number two, many believe that literacy begins in school, and that's a logical assumption. I mean, when you go to school, why do you go to school? Isn't it to learn? So many parents may be surprised to learn that literacy actually requires a foundation, a foundation that begins in the home way before a child uh, enters school. So we'll discuss how and when to build that preliteracy foundation. Number three, most schools have a standard way of teaching reading, but the sad truth of the matter is that 50% of kids don't learn to read or read well in that environment. So we'll discuss the most effective way to teach all kids to read. Four, we'll also discuss, and this is an important one, social and emotional learning and what it entails, why it's crucial, when it begins, and the parent's role in teaching these important life skills. And number five, so many parents are devastated when they first learn that their child is diagnosed with dyslexia, and, and the reason is is because they don't understand it. And they feel that they have no choice but to lower their expectations for their child's future. But we'll discuss that with the proper encouragement, 
support, and accommodation that every child can succeed and reach their full potential. So let's now dispel some of the misconceptions about dyslexia. Number one, dyslexia is not a thinking disorder and it's not an intelligence problem. Now when a child enters school and fails to be able to read, it can be easy to conclude that he or she is not intelligent enough or not trying hard enough. Remember what Amir Baraka's mother said? Call him dumb and stupid because he couldn't read. But if intelligence were the problem or issue, would famous people like uh, Albert Einstein or Thomas Edison, would they have been able to accomplish what they did? Now, someone that I can relate to, I'm a big fan of, and that is author Agatha Christie. How many people here like her stories? Now, were you aware that she had dyslexia and dysgraphia, that it was severe enough where she could not write down her story? She had great story ideas. She had lots of, lots of wonderful ideas in her mind. So what did she do? Well, she dictated her stories to her secretary. Now, just imagine what would have been lost if she didn't have the support to give her intelligence and creativity an outlet. Number two, dyslexia is not a vision problem. There are no special glasses, there are no vision exercises that will resolve dyslexia. Now while it's always a good idea to have your child's vision tested to see if they need corrective lenses, those will not resolve dyslexia. Number three, dyslexia is not attention deficit disorder. Now, while some kids do have coexisting conditions like dyslexia and ADD, ADHD, the struggle to read is not caused by a lack of ability to focus. Number four, dyslexia is not a phase you can outgrow. Now, I can't tell you how many times when I've mentioned to people that, that I'm dyslexic, they say, oh yeah, I used to be dyslexic when I was a kid, but not anymore. <laughs> well, they weren't actually dyslexic. Dyslexia is not like growing pains. While dyslexics can learn to, learn to compensate for their challenges and read well, dyslexia is a lifelong issue. Number five, dyslexia, and this is an important one, dyslexia is not due to laziness or a lack of motivation. It's important to thoroughly understand and embrace the fact that a child's struggle to perform academically is not caused by some sort of character issue. It's not laziness. It's not a lack of desire or a lack of caring. It's not a lack of motivation or a lack of trying hard enough. In fact, the emotional healing begins for a dyslexic child when they are helped to see and praise for how much effort they are expending and how that hard work will pay off over time. So we talked a little bit about what dyslexia isn't. So what is dyslexia? Well, in a nutshell, Dyslexia is a mechanical problem. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, our brains, our brains are hardwired for speech. Most infants begin making sounds in imitation of their parents within a few months of life. That's how our brains are wired. We hear, and over time, we, we learn how to speak. We learn the language. But unlike speech, our brains are not hardwired for the written language. See, written language is a form of code. And it involves connecting those little abstract marks on the page, the alphabet, with the spoken word. So the written word must be decoded. It's a mechanical process. The reason dyslexia exists, and this, this has been demonstrated by brain scans, is that structurally, the parts of the left hemisphere of the brain that are responsible for decoding the written language are smaller, less active, or non-active in dyslexics depending on the degree of dyslexia. Let me repeat that. The parts of the left hemisphere of the brain that are responsible for decoding written language are smaller, less active, or non-active in dyslexics. So decoding the written word is never automatic for dyslexics. Now for any dyslexic, and this is important to understand, fluency in reading is achievable but it is never automatic. Now, it might appear to be, okay, we finally got little Johnny reading now, so that means that part of the brain is now working. That's not the case. The dys dyslexic brain must continue to labor through the workarounds, and that will always take extra time 
and require accommodation. Now, let me give you an example of that. I'm going to uh, talk about myself again. There's a lot of foreign movies with subtitles that I would love to watch. They look like they're, they're great movies. I can't watch them. You know why? If there's more than just a few words on the screen, I can't see them, comprehend, read them, and comprehend them fast enough before it goes to the next screen. And so by the time you're two, uh, a minute or two into the story, I'm already completely lost. So for that reason, I can't watch movies with subtitles. See, that when I see a word, there is always a lag before I can comprehend the word. Although I am a proficient reader, it will always be slow and laborious. It'll take extra time. Reading is always a manual process in the brain for dyslexics, and it remains for life. Because the structure and mechanics of the decoding part of the brain or is the root of the issue, each dyslexic must figure out ways to work around those limitations. It's like having a dial-up internet. How many people remember the, the old modems, the 300, who had a 300 baud modem? I remember my first boat motor. I thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But it would probably take an hour or more to download a simple picture. And dyslexia is kind of like that. It's like having a, a, uh, a dial-up modem in a high-speed world. Things just take extra time. Sibling conditions. I, I mentioned at the outset that uh, I uh, struggled with dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and a little bit of dyspraxia. And there are other sibling conditions as well. So what are those, and how do they affect a child? Let's talk about dyscalculia first. Dyscalculia is a difficulty with math, numbers, sequencing, and directional matters, up, down, left, right, and so forth. So how does dyscalculia affect the child? Well, in my case, I had trouble with directional matters, for one thing, left and right. Now, I knew that I wrote with my right hand, and so when I was told, okay, go left or go right, or raise your left hand or raise your right hand. Every time, I would have to stop and think, okay, which hand do I write with? Okay, I write with this hand. Okay, this is left. And so there was a lag there. And I had to do that for a good two or three years before I finally got that uh, figured out. Learning sequences is a challenge for uh, dyscalculics. Difficulty following instructions. Uh, I want you to do A, B, C, D. I might get to A, but forget about B, C, D, and whatever's after that. Inability to remember multiplication tables, I still can't to this day. Trouble remembering the sequences of the alphabet. Now, I can say the alphabet. I can recite it A, B, C, D, all the way through. But I would make a horrible filing clerk. Because if you gave me a file, unless it was something that was after A or B, and says, I want you to file this, I would have to recite the alphabet in my head to say, okay, okay, it goes out there, this letter. And I would have to do that every time. I just can't seem to remember that. Dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is difficulty in putting words on a page. It can involve poor handwriting and a challenge in holding a pencil property. Now, probably the biggest challenge with dysgraphia is difficulty forming sentences on, on a page. If I, had to write out, if I had to write out my stories, or if you asked me to write out a couple sentences, I would really struggle to do that. I require a word processor to be able to do that. We, we know what we want to say in our heads, but getting it from our head on paper, that's the challenge. Remember Agatha Christie? She couldn't get it down on paper. She have to, had to dictate her stories. It has taken me years of effort and the use of technology like word processors to compensate for this difficulty. Dysphonia. Dysphonia is difficulty coordinating the sequences of muscle movement of the mouth, lips, or tongue, resulting in slow or difficult to understand speech. Then there's auditory dyslexia. That's difficulty understanding the spoken word. Now, while the brain is usually hardwired for speech, as we, as we mentioned in the outset, some dyslexics, dyslexic brains have trouble processing the spoken word through the mental buffering and integration system. In other words, speech comes too fast to assimilate the words and understand what's being said. It's just like me trying to read subtitles. It goes too fast before I can actually read it and comprehend it. Dyspraxia. Dyspraxia is a lack of coordination in muscle movements. 
And you notice I didn't trip when I came out here, so I'm, I'm doing much better there. See, no child is born coordinated, but these skills, they must be learned and practiced. However, for the child with dyspraxia, it's as if their brain, their brain isn't always sure where their body is as it moves through space. The result? They're clumsy and accident prone. Now, my mother always said that I was like a bowl in a china closet. I was always tripping over things, dropping things, knocking things over. Now, this was extreme, especially difficult when we would have company. As I got older, we would have company or we'd go out to eat. Inevitably, I would drop my silverware, knock over my milk, whatever it was. And sometimes I would be ridiculed or teased about it. And more than one occasion, I left the table in tears and wouldn't come back because I was so embarrassed. As you can see, th there can be a lot of complications, a lot of challenges with dyslexia and its sibling conditions. So what will help? What will help to give every child, not just dyslexics, the best start in life? This is where we come to shared reading and preliteracy. One of the most important and beneficial things a parent can do to help their child is shared reading and building a good preliteracy foundation. Now, what's involved in this and when can parents begin? Well, believe it or not, preliteracy actually begins before the child is born. Now, how can I say that? Doesn't make sense, does it? Well, there was actually a study. This is a study that's in, in my book, Raising a Child with Dyslexia. Uh, mothers were asked to read nursery rhymes, the same nursery rhymes, to their unborn ch born child regularly every day, and to do this over a period of time, you know, the last couple months before birth. Now, after birth, when the mother or even another adult would read those same familiar nursery rhymes, there was a measurable physical relaxation response. Now, if they were to read a nursery rhyme that wasn't read to the baby before birth, they didn't have that same response, only with those familiar nursery rhymes. So, preliteracy actually begins, you can begin reading to your child before they are born. An understanding of how print works. From a very young age, when you have your young child sitting in your lap and you have the book open, by pointing to the words on the page as they're read, and going from le left to right, from top to bottom, this demonstrates how reading works, and also that each little mark on the page uh, has something to do with the words being spoken. And as, you're, as you do this consistently from a very young age, children learn that. This is a very important preliteracy skill. Narrative skills. The ability to narrate means that a child has learned how to tell others what they're thinking about, what they're imagining, what they're dreaming, what they're doing, but most importantly, how they're feeling. It means that effective self-expression is being learned and practiced. This is learned through repeated uh, shared reading, storytelling, and interaction with parents. Number four, vocabulary development from talking and reading together. Don't be afraid to use big words. Now, I can't tell you how many times parents have come to me and said, uh, does these books have any hard words in them? Thinking that anything beyond see, spot, run is just way too advanced for your child. Well, studies have shown that the more words even big, complicated words a child has heard before they enter school, the more advanced their reading skills will become over the next few years. Now think about this. Every word, even the simplest two-letter word, is a big word to a newborn. But how do they learn not only the word, but understanding the meaning of them? By hearing it repeatedly. So don't be afraid to use your words with your child, whether it's in books or in conversation. Nurturing an interest in books and stories. When you have regular shared reading with your child, stories that your children enjoys and loves, this fosters that love of story and your child's interest in books. And this brings us to the psychological benefits of shared reading. So we talked a little bit about vocabulary and narrative skills, but there's also a deeper benefit of using our vocabulary words with our children. It allows a child to use their words 
to express themselves and to communicate effectively with what they need. See, only by knowing, a child knowing and understanding the right words, will they accurately express what they're thinking and feeling and how to be able to ask for what they need. The sooner they can do this, the better they'll be able to express themselves. Feeling safe and loved. This is so important. Who of us doesn't want to feel safe and loved? Doesn't matter how old we are. These are, that's the two most important things for all human beings. Those feelings, though, don't just happen automatically, but require a consistent message of action and words on the part of parents. Shared reading. Shared reading is a time for parents to offer their children their full and undivided attention, and then to be able to respond to their needs accordingly. Now, my parents, I never remember my parents ever reading to me or sharing stories with me. However, one of my fondest memories were the, the few times that I would spend the night over at my grandmother's. So my grandmother had a routine. About an hour before bed, she would pull down this big old children's dictionary. It's probably the only children's book she had, but I didn't care. And she would have me sit in her lap, and she would open the book, and she would slowly turn the pages. And I would be looking at all the little pictures in there, because I love pictures. And I see a picture that interested me, I, I would point at it. What did she do? She took her finger and she started reading. And I was just transfixed to every word. I couldn't read, I didn't really understand that connection, but she was modeling shared reading. And when she got to the end, she would then ask me questions. They were very simple questions. And then she would let me ask her questions. I loved that. I never wanted to go to bed. As a matter of fact, that sometimes when I would go over to her house, I didn't want to wait for bedtime. I wanted shared reading right then and there. Never underestimate the power of shared reading with your children. Not only the bonding experience, but what it can mean to them emotionally and psychologically. Developing an identity as a reader. Now this is an interesting one. If you have an identity as something, that means that that's your profession. That's something that you love. That's something you have a passion for. That's something you work hard to learn and to do, like a mechanic. A mechanic learns everything they can about the trade. Did you know you can instill that identity as a reader in your child just by your choice of words? There's a study that showed that when we say to our children, let's be readers instead of let's read together, that helps to instill in them the identity as a reader. Let's be readers. And so the child is thinking, okay, if I am a reader, then I need to work hard at being the best reader I can. I'll put forth the ex extra effort to do so, do so. Studies have actually demonstrated that that simple thing can help to develop an identity as a reader. Love of stories and heroes of self-reference. Has there ever been a story you could particularly relate to as a child? Perhaps a story that had characters in it that had the same feelings or same challenges that you did, and so you could relate to them. And perhaps they overcame those challenges. This is a hero of self-reference. Hero of self-reference is with our storybook character models your experiences. Now, when there's a hero of self-reference that models the struggles, the emotions, the feelings that your child has, this can have a powerful effect on your child, not only in developing a, a love of reading, but if they see that that storybook character is able to deal with whatever challenge that they had, then the child will say, well, I had that too, and he was able to work through it. I can work through it too. It has a powerful effect. Now, my uh, Sir Kay, my award-winning Sir Kay series, offers a fun yet meaningful way for dyslexic readers to learn how to be a hero of their own story. The character Reggie is one of the main characters. Uh, he is dyslexic, dysgraphic, and dyscalculic. Okay, I kind of patterned him after myself. And he fears that he is stupid, and he will never be good enough to, for his father, who has great educational expectations for him. But Reggie learns through the course of the series that not only can he learn to read and write, but that he is a hero in his own right and saves the day on more than one occasion. So the best case scenario is when dyslexia is diagnosed as early as possible. 
Now, some cases, it can be diagnosed as early as 18 months. Now, this topic is considered in great detail in my new book, Raising a Child with Dyslexia. But we're going to consider just a few early symptoms here to illustrate that dyslexia can be noted in your preschool child. Number one, mispronounces a lot of words, especially multisyllabic words. Now, I'm going to tell on my son, and I'm also going to tell on myself as, as a parent, because even though I had the label of dyslexia, I didn't understand it at the time. I also didn't understand the many complications that came with it. So I continued to struggle, not just through school, but also through most of my adult life. When my son was four years old, he was still using dinta dinta. Now, what do you think dinta dinta means? Whenever he would point to the air conditioner, he would say dinta dinta. So that meant air conditioner. He would say effluent for elephant, took it for carrot, cow for car, and so forth. So if you notice that your preschool child is mispronouncing a lot of words, especially the uh, simple words, then it's possible dyslexia may be the reason. Has trouble creating rhyming sounds, where a non-dyslexic uh, child can almost immediately come up with bat, hat, rat, to rhyme with cat, a dyslexic child will struggle to retrieve rhyming words from memory. And when shown pictures of related items, they can confuse, for instance, a baseball when shown a bat. Shows poor phonemic awareness. An individual letter can have more, one or more possible sounds, but when two or more letters are combined, the possible sounds are multiplied. Dyslexics have trouble with both aspects but especially the more complex ways sounds combined. So if your young child is struggling to sound out simple words, this can be a sign of poor phonemic awareness. Now the next two are related to dyscalculia. Shows confusion with directionality, up, down, left, right. Has poor sequencing abilities. For instance, will have trouble following instructions if you tell them more than one or two steps, trouble memorizing the alphabet, multiplication tables, and so forth. Um, now, confusion with directionality, trouble telling time on analog clocks, uh, struggles to tie their shoes, uh, gets turned around or lost easily. Uh, I raise my hand on all of those, by the way. Now, one, there was one particular event that I remember vividly. This was when I was in, still in the first grade. I think it was in my second year in first grade. I was in gym class, and the teacher was, trying to, was wanting to put on a show, an annual, I think it was an annual event. And I don't think I was ever part of the, the uh, show, but I was part of the rehearsal. Now, he had this big parachute, and he'd have all of us children in a circle, and we would hold on to one end of the parachute, we'd hold it taut. And he would play this song by the fifth dimension, up, up, and away. Does anyone know that song? <laughs> to this day, I can't stand it. <laughs> I'll tell you why. As we were holding on to that parachute and that music was playing, he would say, okay, I want everyone to go to the right. I want everyone to go to the left now. I want to move forward, move backward. Now up with the parachute, move left, move right. Now what do you think I had to do when he gave me a direction? I had to stop and think, okay, I write with this hand, so this is left. Now, by the time I kind of got my brains and figured out which way to go, it was too late. So I was all over the place. I was going left when I should go right, forward when I should go backwards. And I was just messing things up. My gym teacher got so angry with me, he, he screamed at me, told me to quit goofing off and kick me in my backside. I was never so angry or humiliated in all my life. And I don't remember a single thing after that. If you notice that your child struggles with directionality, and even before school, then dyslexia may be the reason. Has a family history of learning disability. See, dyslexia is highly heritable. Even in families where no one has had the benefit of a diagnosis, it's easy to sense where the struggle to read, write, sequence, or all the other struggles come from or have, have been experienced by others. Often parents and sometimes even grandparents would come by and say that they recognize their own undiagnosed dyslexia because of seeing their, their child or grandchild struggle. So we'll talk a minute about the emotional fallout. 
See, one of the most damaging aspects of dyslexia is its ability to cause tremendous emotional and psychological damage when it is undiagnosed, untreated, and unsupported. Now, this topic is covered in detail in my book, Raising a Child with Dyslexia, but here are a few highlights. Avoidance and hiding. When a child realizes that he or she can't keep up with or perform like everybody else, a dyslexic child can become very creative at hiding and avoiding. Uh, disappearing, skipping out, trips to the, uh, to the bathroom, to the school nurse, absenteeism, all of those can be a sign that your child is struggling academically. Acting out, misbehaving or disruptive behavior can be one way a dyslexic child avoids having to out his difficulties in reading. It's also a result of powerful negative emotions and fears that have no other expression or remediation. Now the next two are especially damaging, shame and hopelessness. What is shame? Well, shame is instead of saying, okay, I did something bad, I need to fix it and then move on, Shame is, I am bad. And so therefore, if, I am, if I'm bad, I can't do any better. See, shame causes self-loathing, which is extremely damaging to self-belief. Such belief locks one into a victim mode and blocks the notion of looking for creative problem solving. And hopelessness falls right in line with that because no matter what an undiagnosed dyslexic child tries, they can't seem to do what's needed to please the teacher, please the parents to complete the work or keep up with the class. When no adult notices and offers a solution, the child can only conclude there is no solution. And so shame and hopelessness can enter into the picture. Uh, physical problems, panic, anxiety, depression, health problems, performance anxiety, and the inability to ask for help or effectively describe one's experience or feelings causes serious emotional and even physical ailments, uh, symptoms such as uh, constant headaches or constant uh, stomach or digestive problems, uh, existential fear and dread just fall, fall right in line with that. And all of these increase the likelihood, lowers the immune system, and increases the likelihood of infections. For the first uh, couple years of school, I was constantly sick. I can't tell you how many times I went to the doctor for anxiety, um, went to the, uh, for stomach issues, uh, I had uh, infections all the time, either strep throat, sinuses, uh, other infections. I can't tell you how many absentee days that I had. All of these things can be a fallout from undiagnosed and unsupported dyslexia. Substance abuse and violence. A child who feels broken, hopeless, and ashamed will seek escape or distra distraction in un unwholesome ways. Now, this is especially true if the adults in his or her life says that it's due to stupidity or a lack of effort. Remember Amir Baraka's mother called him dumb and stupid because he couldn't read? These kids are at high risk to find alcohol and drugs early in life, often before the third or fourth grade. Violence is another outlet. Violence is, uh, is an outlet when a child feels powerless in order to have some power or to be able to pay back those who taunt or tease him because of his or her struggles. So what can help or prevent the emotional fallout of dyslexia? Here is where social and emotional learning comes in. Social and emotional learning is an area that is almost always overlooked, but it's one of the most important. So how can you help your child cope emotionally with these realities? We'll cover a few items. Number one, educating yourself about dyslexia. Ask yourself questions. What types of dyslexic challenges does your child have and to what extent? What teaching methods will help them the most? What emotions is your child already dealing with as a result? Where do they most need comfort and support? By asking yourself questions and getting answers to those questions, then you'll be in a much better position to provide the emotional and social support they need. Removing shame and hopelessness from the equation. As we've discussed, dyslexic children 
who can't figure out solutions to their problems can only conclude there aren't any solutions. This is how hopelessness and shame enters into their lives. But once diagnosed, help them see that you and their teachers have a plan to help them figure out how they learn best, that they are not broken, they are not dumb, they're not stupid. They're just different. They just have a different way of learning. Help your child understand and embrace his or her learning difference. Instead of shame, rejection, and tragedy, replace that by curiosity. Curiosity about dyslexia, wanting to learn all you can about it, and then acceptance, accepting it. Have lots of discussions with your child. Ask your child questions about their thoughts and feelings and reassure them that they are good learners and that they will be able to learn to read and succeed in whatever they choose to put their mind to. Provide support and accommodation. Do this in practical ways. Make sure they have a clean, uncluttered environment with no distractions to do their schoolwork. Continue to read together. When they start school, that's not the time to start, stop shared reading. You can continue to, to uh, read with them throughout their school years. Audiobooks are a great option, especially if, if you're dyslexic and perhaps are not as adept at reading aloud as you would like to be. You can still do shared reading with audiobooks. You can have, have a, a print book open and follow along with it. Work with your school. Work with your school to get an individualized education plan and then monitor the results. Praising the effort, and this is so important. With dyslexia, Results are rarely commensurate with effort. By recognizing and praising the heroic level of effort your child shows every day, they are encouraged to keep at it. And this brings us to building tenacity and grit, which is, it was, falls right along with that. See, all of us, all humans, want to avoid or to minimize hard, frustrating, or painful tasks. Who doesn't want to avoid doing something that's painful? We all do. Well, children are no different than that. But here is where grit and tenacity comes in. Because grit and uh, tenacity allows a person to make a different choice. Instead of saying, oh, that's no, too hard, I'm not going to do it, to be able to stick with it. Now, why would you stick with something even though it's hard? For one reason. Because the results matter. The results matter to you. So if the results matter to you, if it's something you really want to do, you're going to stick with it until you figure it out and make it work. Tenacity, nurturing these traits, tenacity and grit in your children and modeling them for them is vital to their emotional well-being and to reach their full potential. Now, most would agree that the most important aspect of our early education is learning to read. Why is that? Because we first learn to read and then for the rest of our, our lives, we must be able to read to learn and even to be able to function in a lot of jobs. All children, dyslexic and non-dyslexics, all children can learn to read. Every person has a different learning style, though. It's not just visual and auditory, but also tactile, touch, kinesthetic movement. By only using sight and sound traditionally, only some children learn optimally. But all children can learn to read, and the best method in teaching all children to read is explicit, multi-sensory reading instruction. Let me repeat that. The best method in teaching all kids how to read is explicit, multi-sensory reading instruction. What is that? Well, the term explicit means that the teacher never assumes that the child gets it or that he or she will figure it out, like learning by osmosis. For example, most kids have little to no ideas, idea what sounds letters or groups of letters can make. Yet most schools assume they'll just pick it up as they go along. This assumption is wrong. Multisensory. Multisensory uses all your child's senses in the learning process. It incorporates evidence-based learning methods, phonics, the sounds individual letters make, phonemic awareness, sounds that groups of letters make, tactile, kinesthetic, touch and movement, visual sight, auditory sound. All children, not just dyslexics, learn best using this approach. The more senses are engaged, 
the more neurons in various parts of the brain wire together, forming richer neural connections and thereby deeper, more comprehensive memories. All kids benefit. So here's the $100,000 question. If this is the best method in teaching all kids how to read, then why is not, is not being taught in most schools? Well, there isn't a single college or university that I am aware of that teaches explicit multi-sensory reading instruction as the norm. And it's rarely offered outside of these institutions that focus exclusively on these teaching methods or techniques. And those facilities require that the teacher pay out of their own pocket for this instruction. Well, this needs to change. There's a great book that I published from reading specialist Faith Borkowski. It's called Failing Students or Failing Schools, A Parent's Guide to Reading Instruction and Intervention, an excellent guide to explicit multisensory reading instruction. So as parents and educators, we all want our children to have the best possible life. So what is involved in your child's path to success? Well, we'll cover just four uh, highlights here. One the role of daily conversations. Social and emotional support is the most powerful factor in a child's success. You never want to underestimate how important that is. Spending time together in daily conversations at meals and reading to, uh, daily together allows par parents not just to bond with their children, but to notice small changes in mood, behavior, attitude, and then to be able to reach out to offer support and redirect when needed. Two, parental advocacy. Since every school has different politics, academic accommodations and politics, or policies, parents have to educate themselves and be street smart to make sure their child gets what they require to thrive academically. My book offers comprehensive, straightforward help in this regard. Number three, building better coping skills. The greater the level of dyslexic challenge, the more frustration, hard work, and obstacles the child will have to deal with and cope with emotionally. Your ongoing support and encouragement is crucial. Acceptance, curiosity, and especially self-compassion must be fostered by parents and educators in order to help them cope with these burdens and continued demands. Let me repeat that. Acceptance, curiosity, and especially self-compassion must be fostered by parents and educators. Number four, modeling coping skills for your child. Now your child needs to see you coping with challenges or frustrations effectively. That is so that they will see that one, Frustrations and challenges are a part of normal life, that we all have to deal with those. And two, that it's possible for them, regardless of how difficult or challenging it is, to be able to cope with those frustrations and challenges too. Now it can be sobering to take a hard look at ourselves as adults and ask, how did I do in traffic? Or when I'm on hold for an hour with a phone company or a creditor or some other frustrating conversation or when something gets broken, See, kids imitate what we do. And when parents leverage this fact, it can really help their children to learn to choose how to respond to a difficult situation in a positive way, rather than just react to it. Talk to your child about times that things didn't work out or come easy for you and, and how you persevered and succeeded. Now, if you're dyslexic, you have a lot of examples that you can share with, your, share with your child. Be open with them, be vulnerable. Share those times with them, how that you dealt with some of maybe the very same things your child is dealing with and how you were able to work through that. So what can help you to help your dyslexic child to succeed? Here's where my book, Raising a Child with Dyslexia, What Every Parent Needs to Know Can Help. It's key to current cutting edge research and it provides detailed assistance to parents and educators uh, who want to help their dyslexic children achieve their best life. It is time for a new paradigm. Now to review, we're gonna review a few things. One, as children discover their learning differences, embrace them. 
See, dyslexia is difficult, but it is not tragic. And that's so important to understand. It's not a tragedy. Dyslexic deficits are what they are, and they're not going away. So accepting them with self-compassion and a sense of curiosity, a sense of hope, and tenacity is key. Two, work hard. Work hard to understand and accept the realities of the learning challenges. Facts and understanding dispel fear, dispels hopelessness, and that victim mentality. Learning all you can together allows for acceptance and a shift of energy to say, okay, I'm dyslexic, so what do I do next attitude? Your three, your response to their learning difference teaches them how to respond. As a parent, discovering that your child will have a lifelong struggle when you first discover that will naturally bring up a lot of emotions. Learn all you can about it. Get support yourself so that you can then encourage and support your child. Four, let positivity and hope be your message to your child. Most people wouldn't choose to be dyslexic if they had the choice. I know personally I wouldn't. I can at least say that for myself. Yet one in five have it to some degree. But what are their strengths? What are their, what are their passions? What are their gifts? And how do we encourage one another to focus our energy on bringing those gifts to the table? This is discussed in my book in detail. Number five, recognizing and praising the heroic effort. Again, effort and results are never commensurate in dyslexia. By praising your child's level of effort, you help sustain their spirit, sustain their grit and tenacity. And number six, and this is so important, believe in your child's abilities. Start now. Start where you are today. Every child can learn to read, can learn to write, and succeed in whatever they choose to do. When you look into your child's eyes, they need to see your unshakable belief in their worth and capabilities of a human being. No matter where your child falls on the dyslexia spectrum or how far behind they are today, with your help and your support, they can not only improve, but they can thrive and succeed. You are their greatest cheerleader and coach. There is still a huge disconnect between accepted teaching methods and what most kids actually need. But together, one child at a time, lives can be changed for the better, and the tide can turn so that no child will have to struggle in silence and isolation with their dyslexia. Please come by and, and uh, see me at my table and check out my books for reluctant readers and the resources I have to offer. Now, if you have, haven't pre-ordered my, my book, Raising a Child with Dyslexia, or any of my other books, I do have a supply of books available that I can sign for you. Now, for any schools, any schools that would like an author visit, please come by and see me and let me know that you're a, a school that would like an author visit, and I have an information packet for you. I'd like to give a special thanks Special thanks to the conference committee for all of your hard work in making this conference possible, and the staff of this beautiful facility for making us all feel at home. But most of all, most of all, I want to thank my wife, Elizabeth, because without her love and support, I would not be standing here today. Thank you, and all the best on your journey. <laughs>